Hi, and we're back. This segment is brought to you by Tenable Network Security. They're hiring everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash Tenable Jobs. If you're listening to this show, check out the following two positions. Both are technical and both are work from home. Nessus Vulnerability Research Engineer and C Software Engineer. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean and mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at Onapsis.com. And by NetSparker, developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all of your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise-level online scanning service. For more information, visit their website at netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. Don't forget to submit to B-Sides Tampa The CFP is linked to in the show notes. It's a four-night cruise. The conference is a full two days at sea, sea even, with a stop in Cozumel, New Mexico. Accepted talks receive a free cabin for two. Did I get all that right? Free cabin for two. Like that. Yeah. And the uh, the talk days are the days at sea. Um, So, yeah. So, day one, you depart in the afternoon. Day two is your day at sea, which is also besides day one. Day three, you chill out in Cozumel, New Mexico. Day a uh, New Mexico. Why do I keep saying New Mexico? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you get Paul, to chill out you in New Mexico. Too much Paul, it's another country. It's awesome. It's that whole new country we have here in the U.S. called New Mexico. No, Cozumel, Mexico. Day four, you're at sea, and then day five, you're back in Tampa. Uh, well, no, day four, you're actually nursing your liver. <laughs> Right. Probably. But for the drinkers in us, anyway. That's right. And uh, making sure that your liver is and your kidneys are still inside your body. <laughs> that happens in New Mexico. I mean, Mexico. In Mexico, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Michael Santarcangelo is here with us tonight. It's nice to have you Santa back on the show. Angelo. It's nice to be back at home. <laughs> yes, you've been doing some, uh, some traveling and stuff. My travel is picking up. Turns so, out... Uh, People are ready for some changes. People are embracing change in your world, Mike. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Yeah. I just got to find my way up to the studio now. You do? Yes. Yes. In October, Mike. We've got to meet in October 16th. Yeah, you're going to be here October 16th? I'm trying. Okay. Try harder. Yes, sir. (laughs) 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 I'm trying to find, like, my Sant'Arcangelo story. Uh, something to start off this rant. Oh. I know there's there's no there's no gunner articles. There is this a gunner. Week. There is a gunner oh, is article. There? We'll four, four often overlooked factors to give your security team a fighting there chance. You go. And in it, I wanted to highlight the last. I know he talks about decentralization, and I need to. I'm not sure how that gives you a fighting chance. After I read it, um, designing like an attacker. I think I agree with him there. Uh, rational budgeting, yeah, that's kind of boring. Um, isn't, isn't that an oxymoron? Rational and budgeting, yeah. It's, but integration, right? I think this is an interesting one. Uh, essentially, and there's a lot more in between the lines as a typical gunner post. But he said we've got all of these security technologies, and one of the things that we do extremely poorly or not enough, maybe, is integrating our security tools with each other. And I, I really think that. If we could figure out how to do that well, I don't know. I don't. Want, I don't want to make it sound like you can do that really well very easily. Yeah. I think it. I think there's a lot of work that goes into that. But I think that, to me, of all the things he mentioned, kind of hit home with me for giving your security program a fighting chance. Well, let's let's tackle his first one because I, I actually agree with uh, everything that he's written here. So this is what I like about decentralization. And, and this is an argument that gets played out in a lot of organizations. And it's whether you want to centralize your security responsibility and, and ergo the power and the tools and the control and the governance and the policymaking and everything else. And it all flows through one group versus decentralizing it, saying you're going to push that power out to the edges. And then what happens in that center typically 
Uh, you'll hear people talk about it as a center of excellence model. The idea behind it is the, the, the core group is going to give the guidance and provide support when somebody else has a question, mm -hmm. but you, you're not bottlenecking it. You're not jacking it up. You, you're letting other people do what they need to do closest to the problems that they have, and they have the responsibility to do it. I'll tell you what, when I've seen it done right, you, you can really expand the capabilities of a smaller team, and they can have a pretty broad impact. And, uh, and the piece that I'll add to it is I usually sell this as um, we're not coming in to tell you what to do. In fact, we're going to come in and give you the minimum viable security that you need. We're going to show you how to do as little as you possibly need to do, but to still be secure enough. We just want the whole organization to be consistent. But and, no, uh, Mike, where I've seen this completely fail and go the other way. Sure, of course. Most often in a university setting. In fact, <laughs> just the opposite is true. And Joff's laughing because he's been in the exact same place that I've been. Larry's been there as well. He's laughing. Yep. Now I'm looking at him. He's laughing. Oh, yeah. Because the decentralized model falls on its face in a university setting. But I think that's because more often than not, the folks in the other areas of the organization just aren't paying attention to security. And huh? the only way to get them to pay attention to security is to centralize it. But I think, yeah, I think that's is, a great point. Yeah, but I think what Mike is talking about is if you can get those other people to do security by, not to know if your rules is the right term, Mike, but by some set of guidelines, right, that you put forth. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's almost, it becomes a governance function more yeah. at that point. That, that's, that's the point, right? The central authority has to have the the key word there is authority. It has mm -hmm. to have exactly some right. sense right. of some sense of control to distribute out to the the distributed entities. Where it breaks down in the university setting is that there there is no control. Um, there's yeah, no yeah. there's no authority, uh, and so that they just they just tell you to go away. But if but if there is an implicit uh, organizational support for that central authority, then the model can work as as Bingo. long as you know it's it's clearly yeah, articulated. Yeah. Keep in mind, too, that this isn't unique to just universities. I, I've seen it in a number of other institutions, especially when you lack that central authority. And unfortunately, the, either the technology and or the security groups have that reputation as being bottlenecks and telling people no instead mm -hmm. of supporting them. Then your shadow IT pops up. So th this is oddly a strong way to start to bring that back into harmony. It, it, you come in and say, look, we're not replacing you. No one's going to lose their jobs. But – we need to work together. Help us understand what you're doing. And that's, and that's kind of where that minimum comes in. Like instead of saying, let me tell you what to do. If you guys remember the concept of least privilege, you know, what's interesting is when you say that to somebody, they focus on that word least and they go, Lee, I, no. what it means is you get exactly what you need in order to do your job. No more, but no, no, no less. less. You'll have what you need. Well, so this concept of minimum viable security, and I've started to work with some startups and we're using the same type of a concept there. What's the minimum you need? Like, let me let me help you do just what you need to do from security. Not overkill, nothing more. Don't you don't have to waste your budget. Let, let's not worry about the word waste. But but if you're in that shadow side, and somebody comes high. I'm from security. We're gonna do something to help you out now. Okay, cool. Well, what if that person says, I don't really want to screw up what you're doing. Let's make sure we're all acting together, and you're doing the least amount you need to do. It's it's a different message. I like it. The, the nice part about, I think, about minimum viable is you get to reinforce the concept, I think, of, of, of a baseline infrastructure level security, yep. which is too many people miss that point. They, they go straight for the, the sexy appliance solutions and they don't need to be going there. They need to start with that baseline infrastructure stuff. And minimal, minimum viable uh, fits right in with that perfectly. So sometimes I, <clears throat> in the course of my career in this industry, I tend to feel like, wow, there are really so many companies, the majority of companies, that really don't don't care about security. I feel like they don't care. I feel like they don't want to put the investment in security. Security, we've forgotten about it completely. Yeah. I, 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 and sometimes I read articles and it kind of makes me think that maybe the tide is turning. Now, we've all seen the CSI cyber episode where they did the fake Uber. I forget what it was called. Yeah. But I, yeah. the, the, the spoof on Uber, and Uber has had its share of security problems, and Uber being a very personal kind of service that average everyday mm -hmm. people who have a smartphone will use, certainly I think has the responsibility to do security. So recently they took an additional round of funding. Do you guys, do you guys know what that number is? $100 million? A billion dollars. A billion dollars. Yeah, you, know, you got to put your pinky wow. up to your mouth when you a say that. One billion. 
billion dollars. Mm. A billion dollars. That's a lot of. My, that's my, a significant my, my understanding. <laughs> I, so to, they're a startup, is what you're saying, and, and they got to hope. Someone's well, thinking they might it make it. To put in perspective, one of the larger funding amounts that I've seen a security company take, I think, was Alien Vault recently just got $52 million of funding. So let you put that in, in perspective. Um, in any case, they have uh, the articles I've read said they're looking to quadruple their security team from 25 to 100. Yep. Now, oh, I, I want to say that, right. uh, that I think maybe the $100 million figure came from that they said that they're going to devote maybe $100 million of to, that to security. Right. I thought it was so I, – when I thought it, that it was the whole thing, but I think it's the $100 million. I think you're right. right. Well, so, so – I mean, I think what that says is there there is a tone out there that, that people do consider security as critical to the to the bottom line, which is, which is encouraging. I mean, it that is. does give you a little bit of hope. Uh, I think this is useless unless they accept chip and pin in every Uber car. Then, <laughs> then, uh, then Jack can ride in comfort anywhere in the world. Can we can we smack him no, from yeah, a and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and I'll, you don't I'll pay in the safely. car though, Mike. Yeah. My, Mike apparently. Has yeah, you don't pay in the car. Yeah, I've apparently. never taken Uber. No. Yeah, yeah, you, you don't, don't pay, pay the in the car. car. I like my kidneys. I, you pay I with want, you, uh, pay with, uh, <laughs> you pay with Bitcoin in the <laughs> on the phone. You just transfer Bitcoin. Here's the thing I think is interesting. Right. It's, it's a great round. And I, I appreciate that they say, hey, we're taking security seriously. So what we're going to do is we're going to quadruple the staff. Oh, OK. So so your problem was people. It, it wasn't defining the problem set or using the right tools or, or any. It, this was purely a, a people problem. Doesn't that kind of fit into that whole narrative then that we don't have a, a, enough people and there's a talent shortage? There and is. So actually, I, yeah. I'd rather. Where, rather where are they going to get seventy-five security people to go work for Uber? I know we can't find two. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, no. hey, Paul. Depends. Depends what they're paying. Okay. But, no, but that's true. Where? Um. What, what I'd find. You do have hundred million. A, yeah, a more yeah. inter- A more interesting statement to me would be: A, we're going to quadruple the staff. B, this is our focus. This is where we are going to put the effort. That that you know, if they could say that. That would be a more interesting well, statement. Clearly, clearly, it's they not did. because they took a billion, and what are they going to do with that other nine hundred million if they're not going to put it on security? Clearly, oh well, they gave it company. to me already. Yeah. You know. yeah, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Linus Torvalds was quoted in an article from GeekWire, and I don't know. When I read the article, I felt like when he talked about security of the kernel and he talked about security of Internet of Things, that he was just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Security is a problem. Yeah, we've made some strides, but I just thought it was very bland and not really all that passionate and not very all that prolific when he talked about security. Let's see if I can find a... Well, that's right, because well, he, he's, he's a Linux kernel hacker, not yeah, a Linux security. But he, he says, in terms of IoT, he says uh, it's really uh, hard to get rid of unnecessary fat because every developer knows things tend to grow. And I do expect if you want some really small devices, you'll have to look at other alternatives. That's like almost like not... That's a non-answer. Questions. That's, and, that's a non-answer, yeah. And then the answer he gave to um, on the topic of security, he says, most of the security issues we've had in the kernel haven't been that big. Most of them are just stupid bugs that no one really thought of as security issues normally, except for the fact that some clever person comes around and takes advantage of them. That's, again, I think, skirting the issue. Uh, I was that's really, kind of a non-answer, too. Yeah, I was really unimpressed with his answers. Yeah, that's that's not um, that's actually disappointing. I, I, I will and I will argue that I would argue that it's not his necessarily area of expertise. I think I'm not pro- sure what it, yeah what is his role now. I mean, he probably is just managing all the developers. Those are very management style answers. To yes. be honest with you. So, it also felt a little bit dismissive. Yes, he, he always he, historically, Mike. He's been like that when it comes to uh, security. He's very dismissive of it. That tells me early in his career, he, he encountered one of those security people that told him no to everything, and yeah. he didn't want that. Uh, or someone. Yeah. Uh, is it, he needs the, a hug. The security. We're chasing the street. The dude yeah. needs a hug. He does. He needs, he needs, he needs a, he needs a hug, hug from a security guy. He needs a hug from a security guy. Well, also, and I think he probably fell victim to the, the catnip and the uh, kind of like blowing things out of proportion style security yeah. that we have. To be, oh, my God. Look. The sky oh, is my falling. God. The sky awesome is falling. Awesome use of risk right. catnip. I yes. am so excited. Well, it's a bit disappointing to me because he had an opportunity to talk about how his everyday management of the development practices could 
integrate his security thinking, and, and he's got to have some of that somewhere. That'd be well, a much one, better one answer. answer. Joff, you give a much better answer than Linus. Okay, Joff, you're yeah. in charge now. <laughs> I'm the boss. Hey, you're great. in charge of security for the Linux kernel. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no, no, I mean seriously, because any any really a really in depth developer at a kernel level, they think security all the time. They may not verbalize it very well, but they have to. Yeah. I and mean, it's just it's the nature of what it is. Well, and because I mean, integrity is something that's on their minds all the time, and just by nature of thinking of providing integrity you're providing security so it, that's but, exactly right but the kernel's also smaller than almost everything else right by by nature I, I appreciate it's getting bigger over the years but i mean it shouldn't have a lot of extraneous stuff in it right so, one, one 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 would hope it depends hope. on the kernel model <laughs> whether it's a monolithic kernel okay versus a highly modularized kernel in the yeah. in the linux case it's highly modular in nature uh which Probably means the core of it is relatively small, and um, you know. Except when you start going IoT, which you're often finding um, monolithic kernels, right? And built for a specific yeah. purpose, and yep. all together, I think you end up with a lot more lines of code. This, this, by the way, and Paul, this is the, the kind of thing that, not so much necessarily for a news story, but but I want to pick your brain more, and, and we'll put it out there for anybody else. I'm starting right. I mentioned I'm starting to get involved with startups. There, there's a whole startup community here in Myrtle Beach. And I'm, I'm loving the stuff people are doing, but IoT and these small things are coming in. And I had a chance to talk to a company a couple of weeks ago, and I felt like you. I was asking them questions about their firmware and where they sourced it and, and if they tested it, if they even thought about it. And, and they looked at me and they said, we never even, that never even crossed yeah. our minds. So, you know, sometimes when we say people don't care about security, that's, that's possibly true. But sometimes they, they, they do care. They're not sure the questions to ask, but I'll tell you, things like the kernel in IoT – uh, of the of the software that they're using, things like embedded devices and firmware and everything else, we're really at the early stages of this. And I, I think one of the benefits that we can provide to the startups and to the community at large is how to just think about this stuff, right? Go back to that minimum side. I'm not saying you have to do all of this stuff, but are there three or four questions that, that somebody would ask? Does anything come to mind? I mean, if somebody says, oh, I'm a startup, we're going to do an internet of things. Yes. What would you it, ask him? I thank someone on Twitter who ever told me about this. Uh, and I, this is perhaps the most prolific thing that I've seen yes. that I think is going to shape the way we think about Internet of Things as it relates to security is that Google has come up with a new project and they've come up with their own Wi-Fi router. It's called OnHub. The significance from a security perspective is that it talks to the cloud it gets all of its firmware updates for the cloud, and it does that all automatically. It sounds like without any user interaction. Mm -hmm. It auto-updates its own software. That, and that, is, that is the definition. model that is going to take, that is going to, I think, change the conversation mm -hmm. when we talk about IoT security. I'm uh -oh, not going to say absolutely. this. Absolutely. That, that is going to be disruptive but. technology by definition. So uh, I, I've, got, I've got two other questions. You know, how do your, how's your stuff update? The two other mm -hmm. questions that I'd ask you. Mm -hmm. So Michael said three questions is, uh, does your device out of the box after first startup force you to change the default password? Yep. And okay. two, are you fucking nuts? These <laughs> <laughs> nuts, baby. These nuts. <laughs> Did you see how many antennas it has? It's got a ridiculous, Larry, you got to check this thing out. It's got a ridiculous number it has of antennas. 13 antennas. What? Yeah, it's... Lucky number, baby. It's interesting. Yeah, so I don't. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be successful in the market. I don't know if it's going to see widespread adoption. Um, it, it's got a speaker on it. It's it, it's, it uses a dimmable so, light so ring around the like top. It's like a combination between a Wi-Fi router and the what Amazon Echo. Yes. And no, the, I was reading about this. The speaker is for an app that you install on your iPhone or Android, and the speaker will emit a tone that the app on your phone receives. So it's analogly oh, sending the Wi-Fi password. Oh, to people yeah, that are coming that in. Sounds, that yeah, was that one of the security really things that I thought was a little wonky on it was it said something in the marketing description about, beep, 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 hey, beep, beep, we make it easy yeah. to share your Wi-Fi password with guests. And I'm like, oh, that's a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so does Microsoft, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So, but, but the what have we talked about over and over and over on this show for the last probably 2 years and that is in terms of the Wi-Fi router market itself we have bemoaned the abysmal state of it um Google has just set a disruptive uh tone there mm. by saying yeah we're going to bring something that's updatable oh my gosh and you should see the commercial the, the commercial targets 
what we've been talking about in this market for some time. It's like people yeah. with their like cable modem routers going, well, I unplugged it, and then I waited 30 seconds, and then I plugged it back in, and then this light was blinking, and that light was blinking. Like It totally preys upon nice. all of the consumers that have had issues with their Wi-Fi router mm-hmm. and says, mm-hmm. you got to buy this thing. This thing is... What you need it's to solve beast, your problems. Uh, they, they did a good okay, job. Okay, so how many how many dollars are they going to put it on the street for? That'd be that's the interesting uh, question. Yeah. I, mean, I think it was two hundred. I think it's two hundred. While, while, you're, while you're looking yeah. looking up that, um, I wanted to go back to a comment that Michael made that he says, you know, we're just getting you know, we're getting into the beginnings of this whole IoT security thing, and, and I would completely disagree with you, Michael, in that. We were, you know, Paul and I were starting to force people when they were getting into it 10 years ago when we wrote yes. the Linksys router oh, hacking book, God. except we just didn't call it IoT. It was called an embedded device. Um, and right. that was 10 years ago. Well, there was no cloud component to I, any of the routers. Look, I think that's a fair point. What I'm looking at... That said, I think we're still at the beginning of it. Yeah. <laughs> right. I was... I, I, yeah. Just I, like I, didn't, I didn't mean to suggest that we've done nothing prior to it. It was just more of oh, a... Oh, no, we've done nothing. The, the interest... Okay. So we've missed some if opportunities. there's one thing we've <laughs> done, it's nothing, Mike, yeah. in this realm. We've done in it the well. context of this conversation. We're consistent, yeah. if nothing else. That's right. So what do you think's more exciting? I mean, I'm looking at it now. So the, so the OnHub, um, it has Google's new Weave language designed to help appliances and connected home devices talk to each other. Is that what you think is the, the breakthrough part to it or the fact that they came out with a $200 hardware device? Uh, I, the, one of the breakthrough parts for me, I think the big one is that the firmware is auto-updating. Yeah. 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 That yeah. Weave but technology the, is like reeks of universal plug-and-play, HNLP, DLNA, and all those protocols that are like, oh, all your devices can talk to each other and share all of these things, and the world's going to be wonderful, but all of those protocols leave out security. Yeah, yeah but, but Paul, wait a second. We talked about the, the issue on this show many, many, many times when we said, you know, if you're going to come up with a, a more secure device that can be updated as, as a gateway router device slash wireless, whatever – you're going to have to have some sort of value add in order to sell it because if you don't have a value add in order to sell it, how can you justify selling you know a two three hundred dollar device versus the you know forty fifty buck device they can get down at Best Buy or whatever? No, I wouldn't. I um, wouldn't say so, that. No, I would say they're just to clarify the price point in this market. I would say they're they're pretty well spot on. I mean, to get something that does uh, wireless N. AC. Wi-Fi, AC, yeah, that number that of does antennas. AC, yeah. yeah, you're looking at two or three hundred dollars to get something that yep. does AC right now. So price point, I think they're spot on. I think that you know it's something that looks nice, and they're marketing it as such to say, well, you don't have to hide your router anymore. Like you can put it out in the open, yeah, and it's not going to look like this ugly thing with blinking lights. Like it's very visually pleasing to look at. Yep. So they don't charge it, more and for it that. It doesn't look like a, you know the Blackbird. Jet. Yeah, like to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't look like an alien spacecraft landed in your living room with all these antennas sticking out of it. Yeah, but I like alien space. No, well, yeah, I mean, us for Joff, that's a good point. For us geeks, right? That stuff appeals to us. But for the yeah. average everyday person, they're like, I don't want. I want something that's going to look nice in my small apartment because I paid a lot of money for decorating or whatever. I want something that's yeah, going to no, look no, nice. I, I I'm get, not saying and, it's like the <laughs> primary thing, but it definitely plays into, I think, the price. <laughs> and, and that's that's part of the point I was trying to make with the value add, right? They've got, they've got to be able to sell something that's that's got the aesthetics and that's got the functionality that, that goes way beyond just the auto update. The auto update of the firmware side of it is very important from, from our perspective and I'm glad they're taking that step, which is streaks ahead of the other vendors. So that, that's a good thing. I'm not sure what they're using the Bluetooth for on it. What are they using the Bluetooth for? I guess Ooh. the connection to your phone. Phone, probably. To your phone, to, to your phone. yeah. And so you manage it with, a, with an app. And so I, I, I think it's worth looking at. I'm not saying it, it, it's going to solve our security problems, but it's something that I saw recently. I was like, wow, someone is bringing to market a device that they're marketing as auto-updating firmware. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying I'm not giving up my... Uh, my flash-based PC that I use for my Edge device. What would be Sorry. awesome, and we had Daniel on the show that talked about his separate device that does it, monitors your... Yeah. would be awesome is if you could buy a device that would replace your Wi-Fi router that helped you secure all the devices on your network that notified you on your smartphone, hey, your Nest thermostat needs an update. You should go update that. There's a security alert for your home security system to protect your house. You mm-hmm. should make sure you go update that. I think that's the next level that we need to get to. Well, you next can do that, Paul. You, I'm sensing a, I'm sensing a spinoff in, in, in progress here. 
So um, yeah, yeah, would be we awful. could be taking fifty-two million. I mean, come on now. <laughs> it does have Zigbee. Shoot for the billion. Shoot for the billion. Shoot for the billion. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what other stories we got, Paul? Come yeah, we on spent now. way too much time on that. Hey, I want to hit one of mine yeah, go real ahead, quick. Diary. And it's real quick. It's under the category of, God damn it, when the, where was this two weeks ago when I was doing a pen test? <laughs> I hate uh, it when that happens. It's the, uh, <laughs> the semantic endpoint protection um, uh, vulnerabilities for remote, co- uh, remote command execution and all sorts of other stuff in both the server and the client. Um, of course, working on a pen test where they had secu- uh, the semantic endpoint protection. Uh, and, and that was sort of the last thing that was really stopping me on some of this stuff. And had I only known that I could have pwned the crap out of them because they had semantic endpoint protection as opposed to having it, um, where, where, where was this, you know, two weeks ago? Um, just sort of indicative of me that... Uh, the the endpoint protection suites are not going to be left alone anytime soon. Mm. <clears throat> uh, they're, they're still very active uh, in, in in improving themselves, which is a good thing, right? Yeah. Um, I yeah, mean, I, I, I want to ask ask you guys as as pen testers, um, when that happens, and I mean that's happening whether you realize it as a tester or not. It's happening whether you realize it as a customer or not. Uh, how should we respond as the people protecting our networks, like? Hey, I just had this pen test and I did okay, but maybe there was this one vulnerability that came out shortly thereafter my pen test mm-hmm. that had that been available during the pen test, Wait a minute, it would have over. been a, like a totally different story and could have given you access to yet other vulnerabilities on the internal network. Now, I'm sure you guys would find another way, right? Yep. Most of us do. <clears throat> but, you know, from an organizational perspective, like how do I deal with that situation? Is that just on me to have a good vulnerability management and patch process, right? And then the pen test really kind of, I think, brings different value. Though. Right, yeah, the pen test is a point in time type of thing. Mm. And, and for example, like this particular one, you know, we, uh, this one came out and said, hey, you know, we gave you that report. It, it was only a couple weeks ago, and this thing just came out. You guys may want to consider looking at this, see how it, how it affects the outcomes of the report. We had no idea that this was happening. Right. Um, you know, welcome to the evolving state of right. security. They're, but they they're, have they're, the they're a very robust <coughs> customer. That, they that have the pen test that. report to use as a framework to do some more threat modeling. Yes. With you <laughs> saying, hey, we did, here are the results. But, however, you know, in the meantime, mm-hmm. like these other things came out. So fix yep. all the stuff we said in the pen test report, but then do some threat modeling yep. based on what we yep. did and based on this new information. And, and, I think that's a sound. And, and I think in this case, there was some threat modeling on, on our behalf. And, so you and did some threat cases. modeling yes. for them. Yeah. So the, yeah, the, the yeah, big yeah. deal is, is that we were there to do some testing against some very specific platforms. Okay. Um, and the way that they decided to protect that was to use semantic endpoint protection and an application whitelisting product. product. Mm-hmm. And that was really their only protection for this particular platform. Really? Because semantic endpoint protection does whitelisting. But they put another whitelisting program. Yeah, so they were not using the application whitelisting mm-hmm. function. It was strictly antivirus type stuff. It was mm-hmm. not properly configured, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, our ultimate recommendation for that was you cannot rely on additional software such as SEP right, and, yeah, the whole, and yeah. an application whitelisting to protect a... Um, uh, a platform that is inherently vulnerable and has been end of life. I gotcha. You guys need to move into the 2014s, yeah. <laughs> into the <laughs> and not 2003, 2008s. Yeah. <laughs> Larry, you said something there that I want to I want to follow up on because I yeah. think it's interesting. Do do you or Joff? Do you guys ever, when you leave an engagement, do you monitor for some period of time for anything that might come out that affects it? I mean, because because. Look, I, I haven't been an active pen tester in a long time, so I, I don't pretend. But I know that in the past, I mean, you fingerprint a network, you look for, you see something, you're like, I can't get that now, or I can't get that today, but it kind of lags in the back of your head. Do you catalog any of that stuff and follow up with people, or is there a market for that if somebody isn't doing it yet? That's I a bet, good question. I bet there is a market for yeah. it. Um, is that some, you know, is that something that we actively do? No, it is more of a a good faith effort because you know we we like our clients, we like them to to be repeat customers. And, you know, having to provide and providing some value add when we can. Hey, guys, you know, it was really awesome being on site with you guys. And, and you guys are a lot of fun. And, you know, we're really here to, to help. Hey, we just saw this thing that might interest you. And I just was thinking of you guys when I read this and you wanted to pass it along. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, that, I that being say, said, I, like, uh, Secunia has led the market in exactly what you're talking about. They've got a vulnerability something or other service where you basically say, this, this is, is all stuff I'm running. Tell me about vulnerabilities that happen in all the software kind of thing. Okay. They've had that forever since, like, the beginning of time, and they still offer it as a product today. Okay. I, I was going to chime in and just say, ditto, Larry. Um, we, we tend to do the same thing, you know, that the, the, uh, follow up kind of a, a best effort uh, kind of process. But um, it only gets difficult when we have uh, a customer that, that sees security in black and white and absolutes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to come around and, and re educate them that, that, that this is a process, um, that this is a point in time is a very good phrase to use. You know, what you're seeing here is a point in time depiction of your security stance, things will change in the future, guaranteed, you know, and, and sometimes that's a little bit difficult, but, yep. you know, that's, that's Yeah, I, w I would typically remind customers, too, like, if it, you know, I did a pen test, and then I see an exploit for something, and I'm like, wow, I remember seeing that something that there's an exploit for on this pen test for a customer X, Y, Z, and I'll shoot them an email and be like, dude, I remember seeing this in your network. I don't know if you still have it today, but if you do check out this exploit sure. kind of thing. But yeah. like yeah. Joff and Larry saying that's kind of a good faith uh, exercise yeah. today. Yeah. Un unfortunately, the business reality is things are time constrained and, and the engagements, you know, have have a certain uh, t certain time period and then we, you know, we finish, we finish. You know, that's just the nature of it. But I think most of us do try to cultivate those relationships. We will send follow-up emails and stuff where possible. Yep. Absolutely. I'm trying to relate the... Do it yourself, Swiss Army Barbie multi tool. I'm gonna be able to build one to of these. security. I mean, <laughs> it's a really fun. Pro I mean, it, it's a Swiss Army. It's a Barbie, but it's a Swiss, Swiss Army. Swiss Army knife shoved up her butt. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty Whoa. much, it's the way. <laughs> The way it goes. I don't know what that, how that relates to security. You always need to have a tool when you're doing I security guess stuff. Yeah. It doesn't matter how, what kind of tools you have how, or how, how many they're times packaged. Have you, have we, I shown up the podcast and you go, hey, Larry, check out this new thing. And you disappear and five minutes later it's apart. That's right. And you come back and it's like, dude, I haven't even turned the thing on yet. And you just voided the warranty. <laughs> how many times has that happened? This how many times have you brought a Barbie <laughs> doll to the studio? Oh, wait. Never mind. Every time. Oh, every <laughs> I mean, um. Don't talk about I'm just, re I'm just returning it from borrowing it from you. <laughs> oh. uh, I read a report where industrial control systems owners are unaware of internet connectivity, and they talked yeah. about some nasty ICS worms in here. Did you see this? This is from the I, mention. I did. I didn't, but I can understand where this is coming from. Yeah, yeah. it was. It was bad. It was kind of scary. They talked about malware that was specifically targeting ICS systems. And I thought it was kind of scary, and I thought it was a good article um, from the folks at yeah. Lou Mention. Yeah, if we've got another minute, the FCC stuff. Let's do it. The All I can say when you say FCC, I immediately, the uh, Family Guy FCC segment theme song starts playing in my head. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, so the FCC issued a uh, $750,000 fine against a corporate convention center for... Um, denying service to users of using their own Wi-Fi and um, demanding that they use the eighty dollar happen, a day Wi-Fi. This happened to Marriott. Too. It happened oh, to a, Mar really? a specific yeah, Marriott. Yeah, and Marriott backed off of it real fast. Yep. and it was one one Marriott. One chain. Marriott, not the whole yeah, chain. Yeah, down yep. in Tennessee, maybe. Yep. And now Taylor. this one is a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine. Yeah. And wow. I think this is really interesting. Um, now I don't. We don't know all the, the the stuff about what the attacks that they were doing against these access points to prevent them from using it. But from what I know about the the technologies that would be in play, they would be uh, spectrum interference, RF jamming, which the FCC is clearly in their domain. The FCC is responsible for layer one, and they um, they have very little tolerance for things like absolutely, that. Too. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I mean, when it, they dis when they discover it, is, it, it is yeah. against the law. It is right. you know right right there in the law, um, but. From the uh, IPS, the intrusion prevention side of the house, where you're doing DOFs and all sorts of DOF other type attack, of stuff, yeah. uh, Beacon DS set DOS, and you name it, um, that's at layer two. Mm -hmm. That's a 802.11 protocol, which is in the purview of the IEEE. And the IEEE has no enforcement arm and has no but the, uh, Yeah, so authority. the FCC can come down but, even but at is, that layer. But it, is, but, thing. But it is an attack. But it is an attack, but it is not an attack against layer one where the FCC is responsible right. for. It's an attack at layer right. two. So but I if you do I the really attack at layer one, let's say I start up an access point on channel six, if you start flooding channel six, you're going to lose all 2.4 gigahertz 
yeah. communications on channel six, yeah. including your own access points. Right. So I would venture to guess from what I know about wireless, which is they're probably layer two attacks Absolutely. as you as you described, and they're just de thing new access points that come up. Yeah. Yep. I feel Larry has a point here though. So where are you going with this, Larry? So I think that these rulings are going to get challenged in that the FCC has no <coughs> authority authority and jurisdiction two. over layer two. They only have authority at layer one. <coughs> <coughs> but how are we going to get to enforce it at layer two? Because there's no, no arm of the law, so to speak, to make any of this happen at layer That's two. Interesting. Going to have to send an email to the EFF. I have to send an email to the EFF, right? Yeah. A I, very well, I nasty email. Well, I think it's something the EFF would uh, get involved in because yep. I think it, it, it falls in the lines of technology now, and consumer protection. Yeah. Now that Why said, should I have uh, to pay for something if I'm bringing my own yeah. now in that this said, day and age? I think the FCC is doing a good thing by doing this. Yes. But I think there could they're be a overstepping their bounds. Ninja lawyers could challenge. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. And I'd love to hear you know, what that loophole is. I'd love to have some more understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's RF jamming, it's clearly illegally FCC as well within their bounds. But if it's a layer two, um, I would argue that they're not. If it's a protocol thing and it's not an RF thing. Right. right. It's not a medium thing. Me- Please they're write in. The in. I mean, if you, you're listening and you work for the FCC... Please. Yeah, right. let us know. Yeah, let us know. I'd love to hear that. Did I'd you guys see? There's an update posted to this. There's like a postscript that says that uh, Smart City reached out and quote, uh, "We did not admit liability, and the FCC did not find that Smart City violated any laws." Uh, yeah, and that that basically uh, the FCC saying. considered the use of this standardized quote available out of the box technology to be a violation of its rules. So, I, I mean, I think I, it's I, I think know. it's interesting. Now, well, now, see, yeah, the, the only the only gray area that I can see is the Beacon DS at DOS, which manipulates a client at layer two to change the frequency of the radio that the client is using. Uh, yeah, so it traverses down into layer one essentially by changing the frequency. By, by changing the frequency, so it's yeah. a, it's essentially oh, so eight hundred two eleven has uh, protocol specific things that you can change the frequency. Yeah, so it's mm, it's yeah. like for doing Cisco clean air. Hey, there's interference on channel two. Uh, Have the access point spit, spit out spit a out, beacon yeah. that say, "Hey, Change I'm no channel. longer on channel two. Right. I'm going to channel six, and all the clients follow it to channel six. So, what do I do as an attacker? I send out fake yes. beacons that say, "Hey, I'm on channel six, and, and all the clients to go to channel six. So they're affecting which. <laughs> they're like, they guys, are. guys, is there a party? What happened here? Yeah, exactly. Where did yeah. he go? Where's and, the party? And, and oh, that's also, the yeah, after Here's a timeout the, the client will go back to channel two. But the thing that's interesting on this is that it's FCC, uh, the Communications Commission, instead of the FTC, which is the Trade Commission. Commission. And I think, yeah. Larry, that's. I mean, what we're seeing right now at the federal level is, is there's, there's, it's not cooperation; it's competition. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. It seems like these agencies are all trying to one one up each other on on who can who can enforce faster and who can enforce more and who can create more policies and rules. But that seems like one of those areas where uh, cooperation might be in the future f- for the two. Right. And that's a very good d- point about the, the FTC as opposed to the FCC. It's a great point. Yeah, but the bottom line doesn't change, right? The spectrum is an unlicensed airspace um, yep. that you know people should be able to use freely. And as a corporation, if you get in the way of that. You know, they're, yeah. they're definitely in a clear space, so to speak, uh, no pun intended, when it comes yeah. to the layer and, one. And that might be what the FCC was doing too, right? They said, to, I mean, to your point, Larry, there, there's a very specific area that they have governance over, but they, they may have a little bit of broad reach in terms of saying, yeah, look, uh, there's a spirit and there's an intent, and what you did violated you did it. both that, of so. those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... Cool. Well, that rounds out the stories for this week. I want to remind everyone that on October 16th, we'll be doing our 10th anniversary episode. Jack, I think, is the only one that couldn't make it, but he's gone like the whole month of October. So he's like, dude, you got to do what you got to do. So, um, but we invite everyone to come down to the studio. All of our listeners just come to the studio. Yeah. And we'll have a big party. So we'll be in the new space by then. We will. Sign lease today. Ooh, new space. Yay. First of the month, we'll be taking over next door as well. So look for that and lots of other things. Larry, takes out. Over and out. Ah, not but in, not in. Out, out. Out, did he say out? <laughs> what What channel are we on now? 47. Six. 11. Six. Channel 13. One. 199. I need a shrubbery. I think those pants need another pedo bear. <laughs> Is 
this thing on? <laughs> G'day, mum. Not anymore, <laughs> it's not. 